When you're purchasing storage, whether it's a local mechanical hard disk drive or a more sophisticated disk array, you're going to see some numbers thrown around regarding the performance of that particular storage. In this micro nugget, let's examine some of these performance metrics. Hey, how big is your hard drive? Boy, it sounds like kind of a personal inappropriate question, <laughs> but how you respond is typically going to be to provide the capacity of your drive. You're gonna look at your friend and you're gonna say, oh, I have a disk drive that is 520 gigabytes in size. Or maybe if this were 20 years ago, you would report that size in megabytes. In fact, what am I saying? Maybe you have a nice hybrid, or as Apple would call it, a fusion drive, and you're gonna go ahead and report your size in terabytes. But realize that disk drive size can also refer to the physical form factor. We're talking about the size in inches of the hard drive. Hard drives today typically come in two different form factors. There's the 3.5 inch and there's the 2.5 inch. What's really funny about this is it's trying to describe the size of the platter that is inside the casing. If we're talking about a 3.5 inch disk drive, it's probably gonna come in a four inch casing. Specifically, it's gonna be four inches wide, one inch tall, and 5.75 inches deep. If you were to rip the thing apart and actually measure the platter, you would probably find out that it doesn't measure exactly 3.5. Maybe it measures 3.7, for instance. So we are making estimations here. All of this stems back from the three and a half inch floppy drive. Yeah, that we used to have. And we refer to these dimensions so that you know, yeah, the drive's going to fit easily inside your device. Solid state drive manufacturers have followed this size standard when it comes to physical form factor. So we find 2.5 and 3.5 inch form factors for our modern solid state drives to ensure compatibility from a size perspective with our systems. But like I said, when someone asks you the size of your drive, you're probably going to be talking about capacity because that's what they want to know. It's kind of interesting, by the way, if you have, let's say, a, oh, let's say that 520 gigabyte hard drive, you're actually not getting that 520 gigabytes for full capacity. We've talked about this in previous nuggets, haven't we? One of the reasons is, is that you can express capacities in either base 10 or base two, and there's gonna be a slight difference in the amount of bytes that's reported that way. Another reason you're not gonna get the full 520 gigabytes is because of overhead that happens with the formatting of the disks and the file systems that you're using so it is a best case estimate of your disk's capacity and the actual capacity is going to be slightly lower. Typically it is, of course, large enough where you're not going to return it very upset to the vendor that sold it to you. Now, another great question you're going to ask the vendor is, okay, I'm about to buy this disc. How fast is it? Now, there's lots of measurements of speed when it comes to disc technology that we're going to get into in this particular nugget. But one thing we have to think about is, okay, one of the things to look at is the speed of the spinning platter. When we talked about the components of the mechanical disc drive, one of the things we said was that the disc the platter inside that drive was extremely thin and extremely rigid and extremely smooth. If it's not rigid, you'll get that platter doing something that in the industry, believe it or not, is called wobble. This reminds me of the weeble wobbles I had as a kid. I think the slogan was, weebles will wobble, but they won't fall down. Wow, just had a major flashback there. So we don't want any wobble in the disc. If the disc is wobbling, this is gonna cause a head crash and we're gonna get what we would see on the outside of the box as a hard disk drive crash. We don't want that. So we have this really rigid disc spinning at a high rate of speed. We don't measure that in miles per hour, of course. We measure it in RPM, which is revolutions per minute. Common drive speeds that we have today are 5,400, 7,200, 10,000, and 15,000. And you always see these abbreviated, or typically you see them abbreviated as like, you know, 7.2K. 
when it comes to the disk speed on that particular hard disk drive. As you might guess, the faster you can get that disk platter spinning, the more efficiently you can read and write information from that particular disk. And again, we'll look at metrics that measure this more precisely coming up in this particular nugget. Now, in an earlier nugget, we went up to one of my favorite places to shop for computers, Apple.com. And in that nugget, we saw that, sure enough, Apple was indeed telling you the capacity of your disk drive. And they were also telling you those revolutions per minute. Yeah, they were saying those values right there for you as you were purchasing your particular disk drive for your particular Apple computer. With some vendors, they get a little sneaky on us. Look at this. So we're up at TigerDirect.com, and we see this Western Digital Purple 2 terabyte 3.5 surveillance hard disk drive, and it uses SATA, 6 gigabits per second. And look at this. IntelliPower. What is IntelliPower all about? Well, if we scroll down and we see the main specifications, notice spindle speed and RPM is listed here, and they don't tell us. Instead, they say IntelliPower. What's going to be happening here is the disk is probably going to be spinning from 5.4K to 7.2K, and what IntelliPower refers to is Western Digital's technology that will spin the disk actually at varying speeds based on power. It'll try and conserve power at times. So we don't really know the exact RPM at any given time for this particular disk. And it's very interesting that Western Digital doesn't even tell us like an average that this particular disk will be spinning. Now, a couple of really important points about this disk speed thing, and these are very, very certification relevant. So please, please tune in right now. First of all, there is a, a, a kind of a trend. The faster the RPMs for the disk drive, the slightly lower capacity the drive is. The slower the RPMs, the slightly higher capacity that we have. This is kind of a rule of thumb. And by the way, that obviously might surprise you because you might think of the faster disk drives as far as platter speed being the most, you know, the, the latest, greatest technology, and they would have the greatest capacity, but that does not necessarily stand true. Something else that's really important is realize that the faster drives, they're probably going to follow the SCSI command set. So they're going to have SAS or fiber channel interfaces. If we're dealing with the 5.4 to 7.2, we are probably going to be dealing with the ATA command set. So we're going to be dealing with SATA inter interfaces on our drives. This is obviously critically important to know. And like I said, that's even important from a certification perspective. Now, as you might expect, we need to get much more granular about the performance of a disk system than just saying, how fast does it spin? How big is it and how fast does it spin? That's not going to be quite enough for us. So we have these great measures of disk drive performance. One category of these measures is called positional latency. Anything that's going to require the heads to move or wait for the platter to spin into position. This is a mechanical operation, and there's going to be some delays here that we refer to as positional latency. So one of these positional latency metrics is referred to as seek time. You've probably heard of this when it comes to hard disk drive technology. Seek time is indeed the time that it takes to move the read-write head into the correct position on the disk platter. You know from our disk section of this course that we're referring to the correct track and the correct sector. Obviously, the faster your seek time, the better. It's going to be expressed in milliseconds, and just like a golf score, obviously lower is indeed going to be better. So you'll probably see this expressed as two numbers. For instance, if we're talking about a 7.2K drive, you might see the seek time reported as 8.5 slash 9.5. And what this is referring to is 8.5 milliseconds for reads and 9.5 milliseconds for writes when it comes to this particular seek time. Now, another positional latency value is called rotational 
latency. And what this refers to is the amount of time it takes for the correct sector to arrive under the read write head once the read write head is positioned on the correct track. So rotational latency is certainly going to be directly linked to the revolutions per minute of the drive. Faster RPM drives have better rotational latency, that would mean less, and where seek time is significant in more random workloads, rotational latency is going to be influential in both random and sequential workloads. Disk drive vendors typically list rotational latency as average latency, and they express it, once again, in milliseconds. Now, a very common metric that you will see storage vendors shouting from the rooftop, rooftops is IOPS. That's input output operations per second. So this is obviously a read or a write operation that a disk or array of disks performs in response to a request from a host. Typically, this would be a server type of request. Now, if you were to really get right down to it, you'd find out that there's really several types of I.O. operations. For instance, there's a read, there's a write, but then there would be a random operation, a sequential operation, a cache hit, or a cache miss. So the type of specific input output operation per second that is occurring is certainly going to be of major consequence, just as the overall size of the input output operation that is occurring is going to be of great significance. So you got to be very, very careful with the numbers that storage vendors are throwing around in order to compete with each other. By the way, all of this reminds me of when I was buying an airplane. One of the things when you're purchasing an airplane that you're going to see is a number that's given to you regarding your flight duration before you need additional fuel. So that's a big deal, right? You want to be able to get in your airplane and fly to some city that you anticipate flying yourself to a lot and you would love it if you didn't have to stop for fuel. So the fuel range of the airplane is given. But you got to be careful because the fuel range is a fuel range that maybe was calculated when there was just one 90 pound test pilot in the aircraft. No luggage, no additional passengers. Maybe they had a tailwind at the time of the calculation, right? So if I'm making this flight and I have a bunch of passengers, a bunch of luggage, and we have a 30 knot headwind directly in our face when we're flying the airplane, we are going to get substantially smaller fuel range and we would have to be really careful with the original number that we got from the particular vendor. In fact, as a side note, it's really sad how many pilots are killed every year because they run out of fuel, having just gone by some fuel range calculation that doesn't really attribute to everything that they are experiencing in that flight. And it's also at this point, I should probably remind you that there's a fuel gauge in the aircraft. They might want to check that as part of their scan of the instruments. But input output operations per second is certainly a big deal. And we want to be familiar with these numbers that we may get from a particular vendor. Now, remember, I said input output operations per second are actually pretty complex because we can have like read, write, versus random, versus sequential. Understand that the most common performance characteristics measured today are sequential and random operations. Sequential operations access locations on the storage device in what we call a contiguous manner. Everything's right next to each other and are generally associated with large data transfer sizes, like 100. 128 kilobytes. Random operations access locations on the storage device in a non-contiguous manner and are generally associated with small data transfer sizes like 4K. When you're dealing with hard disk drives and other similar electromechanical storage devices, the random input output operations per second numbers are primarily going to be dependent upon the storage device's random seek time. But when you deal with solid state drives and similar solid state storage devices, the random IOPS number is going to be dependent upon the storage device's internal controller and memory interface speeds.
Now, a quick down and dirty way that you can calculate input output operations per second or IOPS is to go ahead and use the following formula. It's 1 divided by x plus y, and then you're going to multiply that by 1,000. This formula uses x as the average seek time and y as the average rotational latency. So let's say we have a drive with an average seek time of 3.5 milliseconds and an average rotational latency of 2 milliseconds. This would give us an input output operations per second value of 181. This works only for spinning disks, of course, as we alluded to, and not for our solid state media. So now that we've taken a detailed look at input-output operations per second, you obviously, you just intuitively can distinguish this from throughput. When we talk about the throughput of a disk system, we're of course talking about the raw amount of information that can pass in and out of that particular device without fail, and that is an important point. It's got to be error-free, and that is going to be measured in either bits per second or packets per second. So input output operations per second, a much more complicated value to calculate, and there can be a lot of fuzzy math in that used by the vendors, but the number that more people tend to understand intuitively is the throughput of the particular device. Now it's interesting when you talk throughput because you could actually get pretty detailed in that number. Is it the theoretical maximum throughput? Is it the actual throughput we're getting? Is it a sustained throughput value? So please don't be surprised when you see all kinds of more detailed numbers thrown around by the vendors. Remember, Vendors tend to go to war with each other on these numbers, and then they'll point fingers at the other vendor saying, well, they got their number, but they were using this kind of artificial test, or they weren't using the actual device that you're going to get under actual conditions. So we just need to be educated on all these performance metrics so we can make an informed decision when we go to reveal our checkbook to the vendor and make a purchase. Now, just when you thought there weren't enough terms to describe the performance of your disk system, a lot of vendors want to sound fancy. And so instead of saying the maximum throughput, they will go ahead and say the maximum transfer rate. Okay, great. This is just another way to express the throughput. Remember I said that there's going to be like a sustained throughput? Well, you will often see vendors use the terminology sustained transfer rate. So the sustained transfer rate is that rate at which the disk drive can read or write sequential data spread over multiple tracks. So a lot of rich metrics for drive performance, and now you know. In this micro nugget, we took a look at some drive performance metrics. I sure hope you found this micro nugget informative, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.